Welcome to the lecturette on the abdominal wall. This one's on the nerves. Our objectives here is to be able to follow the course of the last thoracic and the first two lumbar spinal nerves and identify these structures that are innervated by each of the branches of these nerves. And also to be able to describe the course of the ventral and dorsal branches of the last thoracic and first two lumbar spinal nerves in the ox in relation to the distal end of the transverse processes of those lumbar vertebra. Okay, so here we have a section of vertebra for the spinal cord. We're going to find that each spinal nerve has a ventral branch and a dorsal branch. The ventral branch will have a medial branch. That medial branch will terminate on the ventral midline as a ventral cutaneous branch. And so if we have a medial branch, we know we must have a lateral branch. Okay. So likewise, our dorsal branch is going to have a medial branch and it's going to have a lateral branch. Okay, that lateral branch is also going to have a ventral branch as well as a dorsal branch. So our ventral branch has a medial branch and a lateral branch. Our dorsal branch has a medial branch and a lateral branch. And that lateral branch, we will see, gives off a dorsal and a ventral branch as well. So dorsal branch and ventral branch. So if you kind of have that set up in your head, it's going to be a lot easier. Okay, so now let's put the muscles on there. Here's our ventral branch once again. See it coursing ventral to the transverse processes. It's going to innervate the psoas muscles as well as the dorsal aspect of the muscles of the abdominal wall. Its medial branch, as you see here, is running between the transverse abdominis and the internal abdominal oblique muscle. It's going to course all the way down. It's going to provide sensory to the ventral deep body wall as well as the peritoneum. And it's going to provide motor innervation to the transverse abdominis and the internal abdominal oblique, as well as the rectus abdominis muscles. If you look at its course, that makes sense. Okay, and as we mentioned, we have the ventral cutaneous branch, ventrally, which is going to be sensory to the skin of the ventral abdominal wall. Now the lateral branch of the ventral branch is going to provide innervation to the skin on the or the ventral half of the flank and it's going to provide motor to those more superficial muscles of the abdominal wall so the external and internal abdominal oblique muscles as well as the cutaneous trunchi muscle. Unlike the dog, the cutaneous trunchi muscle is also innervated by branches of the spinal nerves in the large end. Okay, now our attention to the dorsal branch. The medial branch of the dorsal branch is easy in that it just dives up into the epaxial muscles and that's all it's going to do. It's just innervate those epaxial muscles. Okay, the lateral branch of the dorsal branch, because it has both a dorsal and a ventral branch, it's going to do sensory to the skin above the transverse processes as well as sensory to the skin on the dorsal half of the flank. Now the branches that are going to be most easily seen will be the lateral branch of the dorsal branch. You will see that emerging from the apaxial muscles just dorsal to the transverse processes. In some specimens that ventral branch of the lateral branch may be seen. Basically, the dorsal branch of the lateral branch is going to be removed with the skin. 
Here I have an image that shows the dorsal branch, the lateral branch going to the skin. But as you can see, as we remove the skin, that's easily going to be torn. Okay, so here we have further dissection showing the lateral branch of the dorsal branch coming out along here, just under the longissimus lumborum. And this lower image shows the ventral branches of those lateral branches. Okay, here's a section from the horse, also showing the lateral branches of the dorsal branch. Okay, so back to this image. Go to the ventral branch. We can see this on the superficial surface of the transverse abdominis muscle. And as it courses distally, we will see the lateral branch of the ventral branch coming off. We may see it emerging from the abdominal muscles about in the middle third of the flank. That medial branch of the ventral branch will continue on that superficial surface of the transverse abdominis muscle after that ventral branch gives off the lateral branch. Okay, in this image here, we can see the ventral branches coming out here. Remember, they are going to come out ventral to the transverse processes. Here we have the medial branches of the ventral branch. And here we can see a lateral branch of the ventral branch. Okay, looking at the equine, we can see these branches coming off down here. These are going to be the lateral branches of the ventral branch, providing innervation to the ventral portion of the flank. Okay, if we remove the oblique muscles, as we did here, we can better see the ventral branches, which give off the lateral branch, and continue as the medial branch of the ventral branch. Okay, we've talked about how it is important to remember these nerves in the ox because we more commonly do flank surgeries in the ox primarily for such things as ruminotomies or cesarean section. It is common to block the lateral branch of the dorsal branch as well as the ventral branches of the 13th thoracic spinal nerve as well as the first two lumbar spinal nerves as they cross the tips of the transverse processes. As you see here the 13th thoracic spinal nerve is going to cross the tip of the, the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra. Likewise, the first lumbar spinal nerve is going to cross the tip of the second lumbar vertebra transverse process. But then we get a more sloping occurring. So as we move caudally, we see that there's more sloping of those spinal nerve courses so that the second lumbar spinal nerve is going to actually cross the tip of the transverse process of the fourth lumbar vertebra. Okay, these distal nerve blocks I'm going to show you here. So this first one, often called the Cornell block, is the distal paravertebral block. As you see from the image, you will place your needles both above and below the tip of the transverse processes. They're showing L1 in the image below. The advantages of this is you can use routinely sized needles. There's minimum risk of penetrating any major blood vessels. Because we are not desensitizing the medial branch of the dorsal branch, we're not going to have any effect upon the epaxial muscles. There's going to be minimal ataxia or weakness in the pelvic limb. Disadvantages, however, is you have to use a larger volume of anesthetic. There's variations in the, in the efficacy of it because the nerves follow variable courses. They don't always read the book. Okay, here's a museum specimen. So here we see where we block the 13th thoracic spinal nerve, here's where we block the first lumbar and the second lumbar. Okay, and the next one here is the proximal paravertebral, 
also referred to as the paralumbar. You can see here that the needle is being placed closer to the base of the spinal nerve. Advantages here, you're getting anesthesia of the skin, musculature, and peritoneum. It's going to be a wide and uniform area of analgesia, and you're going to get muscle relaxation. No additional restraint would be required, and you don't need to use large quantities of anesthetic. There's a shorter post-surgical convalescent period, and the incision site is avoided. Disadvantages, however, is that it is difficult in fat cattle and in some beef cattle because you are paralyzing the epaxial muscles. You're going to get arching of the spine and you tend to get bowing out toward the side you're working on and that makes it more difficult for closure of the incision. Likewise, the same specimen in the museum shows the blocking for the paralumbar blocks. Okay, the inverted L is probably the simplest and most commonly used. It's a rather easy technique. You just, as you see in this illustration, use routine sized needles and basically infuse anesthesia in an L. There's a large volume of anesthesia required, however and the length of time to infiltrate such a long line. You get incomplete block of the deep layers of the abdominal wall, particularly the peritoneum. And as we said, it is an easier block to make. Okay, if we want to do nerve blocks for the mammary gland, we see that the mammary gland is innervated primarily by the first two lumbar as well as the genital femoral nerve. We also get pudendal nerve innervation. We can block the first four lumbar nerves via the paravertebral method. The pudendal nerve is generally blocked medial to the sacrosciatic ligament using rectal ID of the nerve and directioning of the needle. It's not very commonly done in my understanding. Often clinicians will just use local anesthesia with lidocaine they may on some occasions use a subdural, but not usually. Okay, that's all I have for you here. I hope this was helpful.